The SLS rocket is NASA's rocket for deep exploration. This rocket has been in the design for a number of years and has had several iterations. And the current version, the Space Launch System, is set to launch in about 2020 with the Orion capsule on top. This space rocket will enable us to explore deep space in a way that's never been done before. Perhaps going to asteroids, revisit the moon, and possibly even take us to Mars. But it's had a long and varied history, and not all of it's been successful. But first, let's talk about what this rocket actually is. The Space Launch System, SLS, has a number of blocks. The first block that will be launched in 2020 is a two-stage rocket with a couple of solid rocket boosters that can carry about 70 tons into orbit. It's based off of the space shuttle. It's a shuttle-derived rocket. And as such, it uses a lot of kind of proven technology. Now, this rocket will be able to take us to deep space. The Orion space capsule could be a portion of the endeavors to get it into space. However, it is not everything. The Orion capsule can't land on Mars. It could take us to an asteroid, but that's about the limits of what it can actually do. We'd have to have another space vehicle designed to land on Mars that this could be a system of. The Orion vehicle could return from Mars and land safely on Earth, but it could not actually land on the surface of Mars. Still, it's been a great exploration forward in the attempts to get humans into deep space. It came about as a result of the Columbia incident, Columbia disaster even, where in 2003 it was returning from a mission to do science in low Earth orbit. And while it was returning, a heat shield tiled fell and broke apart that had been damaged when it had been launched. And hot gases from re-entry entered into the frame of the space shuttle, melting it and ultimately causing it to break into many pieces. No astronaut survived from this unfortunate incident. And this incident caused NASA, and really the whole U.S. government that's associated with the space program, to reevaluate what NASA's goals are for deep space exploration. And they realized that the goal is to not just be in low Earth orbit. They wanted to give that realm to the commercial industry and have NASA focus on deep space where it really belonged. Some of the offshoots of that program were the SpaceX and now orbital missions to resupply the International Space Station. That happened as a result of this report that was issued in 2004. The deep space mission initially was to take some of the rockets designs that came from the space shuttle, some of the shuttle hardware, and to use that into making a better rocket that could take humans into deep space. Initially, there were two rockets. There was the better developed Ares-1 that would basically carry humans into low Earth orbit. It didn't have a significant amount of payload capacity, but it would be able to take this capsule into deep space, at least to the low Earth orbit, this deep space capable capsule. The Ares-5 would be the truly heavy launch vehicle with a capacity, depending on the various iterations, exceeding that of the Saturn V Apollo moonshot rocket. These two would be launched, they would dock in space, and then from there continue on into deep space. The Ares-5 would never be man-rated. However, developing these two rockets proved to be expensive, and eventually the program was cancelled. The Constellation program that all of this was based off of was cancelled in about 2010, and it was replaced with the Space Launch System's rocket and the Orion capsule. The Orion capsule was a space capsule, is a space capsule that's designed to take humans into deep space. They've done one test of it where it re-entered from a very high orbit. It simulated some of the pressures that returning from the moon would simulate, would create, and it proved to be successful. It's had just an early prototype test. It's designed to launch on top of the space launch systems, and the two together can launch into orbit around the moon or possibly even to some asteroids. The initial version of the SLS rocket will be able to carry about 70 tons into space. The final version will be able to carry 150 tons into space. Even the Block 1 version of SLS can carry more payload into low Earth orbit 
than any other rocket that is currently being designed other than SpaceX's BFR, which can take about 130 tons. And we don't know what the specifications are of New Armstrong, but it will exceed the Vulcan rocket, the New Glenn rocket, and the Falcon Heavy. It will, in 2020, most likely be the heaviest launch vehicle into space when it first launches. However, 70 tons is great, and it will allow you to build a base around the moon, but it doesn't have enough mass to really land humans on the moon. For that, we need something on the order of 130 to 150 tons, and that would come in the Block 2 iteration. We don't even know if that will happen. Since this program was initially created, the idea was, was to launch something into space in maybe 2010 or something like that, but it's been many, many years overdue. It's cost way more. Why is it cost more? Well. There's a number of reasons, but the main reason is they shifted a couple of things. First of all, they took the shuttle main engines that were kind of put off to the side because of the space shuttle being having the engines, and they moved them directly underneath. This created new strain on the main engine tank from the space shuttle design, and it also had to create new plumbing. So all of this had to be redesigned and retested, even though it's based off of the legacy design. The solid rocket boosters went from having four segments to five, and also had to be similarly redesigned and recertified, and thus it wasn't as straightforward as it would have otherwise been. They also ditched the parachutes that allowed them to be refurbished, and instead are going to be discarded completely. The second stage had to be completely designed, and there are a couple of variations of the second stage that are in design, one of them by the European Space Agency. It's been somewhat delayed for them to get this portion working. They having never really worked with a manned second stage to this propulsive capability. Now, there are other things too. The main engine tank was stretched and all of these things caused redesign. And so what ended up happening is instead of using legacy technology to reduce the cost, the legacy technology became kind of a crutch. They couldn't use something greater. The space shuttle main engine is a fantastic engine, don't get me wrong, but not everything about it was absolutely the best. And real life doesn't work like Kerbal Space Program. You can't just stick another tank on without having to redesign everything. And so the rocket's been delayed. It's been far more difficult to build than it should have been and has ended up being more expensive. We also have new heavy lift systems that are able to carry significant payloads into space. The Falcon Heavy is approaching the limits of what the SLS Block 1 can do. It's not quite there, but it's pretty close. New Glenn will be pretty similar. And once we get into the BFR, then it will be able to do something that not even the SLS Block 2 will be able to do. So all of this seems doom and gloom. But I do want to leave with a few positive notes about the SLS rocket. The single greatest thing about this rocket is the payload fairing. The payload fairing is where the payloads are put into before they're launched to space. It protects them in the atmosphere, and this payload fairing is released once the rocket gets outside of the atmosphere. For some of the Dragon capsules and stuff like that, they don't have to have a payload fairing, but most payloads do. Now, the payload fairing for a typical rocket will be maybe three or four meters wide, and this causes some significant constraints. The James Webb Space Telescope, for instance, had to be assembled into many, many different pieces and set in such a way that it would unfold itself in space, and this has led to some enormous cost overruns. It's much more costly than it should have been, or could have been if we'd been able to do something better. The SLS payload fairing is a full 8 meters wide. This makes an enormous difference in the ability to carry heavy payloads into deep space. With 8 meters wide, we could t fit the mirror of the James Webb Telescope in a single segment. We'd still have to unfold the heat shield, but that's a trivial problem compared to getting all the mirrors perfectly aligned that is required. The heat shield could be a little bit off. 
Therefore, the tolerances are way lower, and the James Webb Telescope might have cost a whole bunch less if it had been launched on an SLS rocket. But that withstanding, there are still some significant issues, and overall, it might not have been the best choice. And part of the problem is, too, that being congressionally mandated, they have to divide the work. SLS program brags about how there's suppliers, there's over 100 different suppliers to build the rocket. Well, that creates a lot of jobs, and that's great for business, but it makes the cost of it more expensive than it would be otherwise. The SLS program costs about as much as the International Space Station to maintain, and it has yet to launch anything into space. And even once we get it, because it's not going to be launched very often, it will cost about $1 billion per rocket launch to send it into space. And that's just the single individual cost. That doesn't take into the cost the program itself. Still, it is a pretty neat rocket, and there are some cool things that could be done with it. And hopefully we'll make something good out of it. But until next time, keep on tracking, and let me know what you guys think about things. Take care.